Right. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure. It's a privilege, actually, to have um, Dr. Jess Shackin with us um, this morning. We're hoping we can put this out um, to you pretty soon. Um, but we are really, really pleased that Jess has given up his time. He is a friend of Westlake. Um, he is uh, someone we brought to the school at the beginning of 2020. He spoke to our boys. He spoke to a group of parents. He spoke to our teachers as well. He was really well received. Um, and he was really well received because he's such a great guy and he's someone that we rely on a lot um, for some advice and guidance. So a little more about him for those that you don't know, who may not know him. Um, so Dr. Jess Shackin is one of America's most successful and well-respected adolescent psychiatrists. Uh, he's the vice chair for education at the Child Study Center of a major children's hospital in New York. And he is professor of adolescent psychiatry and pediatrics at New York University at the School of Medicine. Uh, he's featured in the New York Times. He's featured in the Wall Street Journal. He's got a great book out called Born to be Wild. And today for us, he's here to talk about teenagers. He's here to talk about their behavior. He's here to talk about risks. Um, and he's here to talk about how we can keep our teenagers safe and well and thriving. So, Jess, thank you so much again for giving up your time. It's really special that you're back with us, even though it's, it's only virtually. But we'll work on that. We'll get you back to the country some, somehow, somewhere. Um, but yes, I'm going to hand over to you now. Um, and we are so pleased and so excited to hear from you. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you so much for having me. And thanks for the lovely introduction. And when you and I spoke, Andrew, a couple of weeks ago, you asked if I'd talk about a few topics. I'm going to share my screen and show you what you and I came up with that you thought would be helpful for your parents. So I sort of call this a dose of mental health. But what we thought would be useful to hear about was a little bit about COVID. And I'm, I'm not sure about how things are right now with your country and COVID. I think if I understand well, you're on a home-based quarantine again. Is that correct, Andrew? Yes, Jess, we are coming hopefully towards the end of our lockdown. Yeah, so hopefully okay. school holidays coming up and then we're hoping to be back next term, but we've just got to cross our fingers on that one. Okay, so I'll talk to you a little bit about COVID and, and just some ideas about living at home with COVID during quarantine, because we've gone through a lot of that here and I, I know you're going through it too. Then I'm going to shift gears as Andrew and I spoke about the idea of talking about resilience and what resilience is and how valuable it is and what we can teach in terms of resilience, what factors make kids resilience, resilient, and, and the things that we can actually change, which we know a lot about now. I want to talk to you about managing kids at home, and this was based again on Andrew's ideas that, you know, particularly boys at home, sometimes just behavioral issues come up, and so where do we turn to for, for an understanding of that, and finally, when to worry, or when to do something more, in other words, when to take your child to see, some, to see someone like me, a child psychiatrist or psychologist. So what does COVID mean to us? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's impacted all of us in many, many ways. Uh, I hope that you all are able to get vaccines and to move through your quarantine quickly. Uh, I know that your country has been particularly careful and, and good about limiting travel and people coming in and out, which is necessary. We've struggled more with that because of the, the basis of our country and how people in our country are allowed to almost do just about whatever they want. Uh, which has caused a problem for us when it comes to COVID. When you look at children and adolescents versus parents, I want to set up what some of the challenges are and talk to you a little bit about what we can do about them. Kids, uh, many of them, uh, particularly younger kids, may fear getting sick and dying. And it's not uncommon for adolescents to actually believe that their risk of dying from whatever is much higher than it actually is. They may fear their family members getting sick and dying. There may be a major change in routine, which I suspect is what you're all going through right now. A disappointment about not attending school and extracurricular activities. My daughter didn't have her college graduation, for example. Many people didn't get their proms and their dances and their sports and all sorts of other things that get in the way. There can be a lot of downtime, which can lead to boredom and restlessness, a lack of physical activity, which can make everything worse and make kids less resilient, less able to withstand the difficulties that they're facing. And for those kids who get special support services at school, whether it's therapy or, or uh, who get their meals at school, in America, many kids get their meals at school because their parents can't provide them, or physical therapy or occupational therapy, learning support, all of those things are minimally ongoing at best during a time of quarantine. And then there's a question of vaccine eligibility. When are kids eligible for this vaccine? Is it available for them? And what does that mean to them? For parents, the concerns are similar and somewhat different. How do you keep everybody healthy and safe? safe. How do you manage financial concerns? And in the US, many people lost their jobs or were put on leave and we had unemployment, which was pretty good actually for our, for our usual unemployment amounts. But certainly a lot of families 
lost their home, lost their apartments. Uh, it was a really, a, uh, it's been a terrible year and a half for us. Remote learning for the kids, how do you manage that? And particularly if your home isn't terribly large or your internet isn't terribly great, the connections, we've had lots of people in the US parking by libraries or by grocery stores trying to pick up internet signals for their kids, dealing with the loss that happens. I, I, I don't know how much death there's been in your country, but I know a number of people who died from COVID and it's, it's we've had over 600,000 deaths in this country. Managing behavior and discipline in the environment of of change and in quarantine, managing anxiety of your own as you deal with the, the inevitable confusion and unknowing, helping children with special needs, managing teens and, and young adult children who have some different needs from little kids and vaccine acceptability. And I hope that, that you all are very ex, uh, open and willing to receive the vaccine, which is a remarkably safe vaccine, very well tolerated and uh, I, safer, I think, than the flu vaccine that we all get every year. Yet again, in, in my country, there's been a lot of pushback, uh, largely due to anti-government sentiment and things. So I, it's, it's a concern. I hope you're not challenged by that as well. So, so often when we work with families and kids and you know, parents, we say, listen, you know, make sure you take care of yourself first. So like they say on the airplane, put on your oxygen mask first. So what does that mean? That means even while you're in quarantine, getting dressed, taking a shower, making breakfast, going through your normal routines, because that makes everything more normal and more typical in this atypical time. Managing your own anxiety against catastrophic thinking that the worst is going to happen. Catch yourself when you have those thinking errors or those cognitive distortions, as we call them in the business, because they really are just that. They're anxiety and they're pushing you over the top. Limit your news and media consumption because it's easy to get sucked into it and nothing changes that quickly by and large and it's a repetition and it's it's not really traumatizing as we define trauma but it is anxiety provoking it does constantly get you thinking about something negative and something bad stay in touch with family and friends even if that's in facetime or zoom or you know distant uh, social activities Try to make fun plans for yourself and the kids. You can, if you have a pod, if you are isolated, take hikes, listen to different music together, starting the television series together, have family game nights, maintain the healthy habits. You know, I'll talk about this again in a few moments, but the, what we call the triumvirate of good health, exercise, sleep, and nutrition are vitally important. And I know that your school thinks they're important. I know we all think they're important individually, but making sure we get them is an enormous uh, benefit for us and has a huge impact on our wellness and our ability to withstand difficulties like COVID, not only the illness, but also just the emotional distress of it. Expect some regression and be okay with it. Your kids are going to get a little more irritable. You may get a little more irritable. You may not sleep as well. You may overeat these sorts of things and ask for help. I don't know what all the services are in Auckland, but uh, I know what they are in the US and we are available and willing and anxious to help people who have difficulties. Once you are feeling settled and you've addressed some of those concerns, we encourage you to help your kids now. What does that mean? Keep routines in place. Let's not let dinner go from 7 p.m. till 9 p.m. unless that's what you really want to have happen because it works better for your life right now. In other words, as I said before, get dressed, get showered, make your meals, keep things, keep the scaffolding that you've had in the past in place in all ways, activities, bedtime, Make plans for the future, the near future, not just, oh, in two years, we'll go to Fiji, but let's talk about what you know we're gonna do this weekend or what we're gonna do tonight, a pizza night at a movie, whatever it is we're doing. Uh, find fun ways for your kids to stay in touch with their friends and try to help them with that. And maybe that means masked activities, maybe that means socially distanced activities, maybe it means expanding your pod a little bit uh, with your neighbors. Role model, so keep it positive. And our kids learn mostly from us via role modeling. So wear your mask, get your vaccine, uh, keep as most uh, as much a positive spin on this as you can. Uh, take your cues from your kids about what they wanna know and about how much to tell them. They may not wanna know everything. They may be bothered by the media, a little bit is good. Ask them what they know, ask them what they wanna know. Really importantly, we are realizing and learning more and more and more about how toxic Screen time can be, doesn't have to be. It's here to stay for a while at least. We're not advocating that people do away with screens, but know how much your kids are, uh, how much time your kids are spending on screens and do what you can to moderate it because the vast amount that many kids are spending is not good for them. In the US, 
Teenagers spend routinely seven hours on screens a day. That's the average, and that is outside of school. And middle school kids are spending about five and a half hours a day on screens. So this is, you know, iPads and, and laptops, desktops, and phones. And we know that that's, and television. And we know that that's not necessary uh, or good for them. It causes a lot of problems. A little bit of staying up with what's going on on Facebook or Instagram or whatever the kids are doing is, TikTok is one thing but immersing yourself in it constantly is another. And when you're quarantined, it's easy for that to happen and easy for it to slip. And you need to choose your battles. So sometimes you're gonna use the screen, but watch those limits, whatever your limits are, and don't be afraid to employ them. Stay in communication about COVID and about everything else. It's not just one conversation. Get them out for exercise and activities as much as you can. As I said already, it's okay to choose your battles sometimes. And you know there is an opportunity here a, a teaching moment, as there always is, when there's something new that happens. And I think one of our best teaching moments here is helping kids to learn to deal with anxiety, something which we think a lot of our kids aren't very good at, because at least in most Western countries, parents have been doing more and more for their kids and letting the kids do less and less for themselves. And we know how important it is to kind of in parentheses, never do anything for your child that they can do for themselves. Of course, there'll be times when you do things for them, but by and large, our kids do better when they take care of it themselves. You wanna, you wanna move from, I'm proud of you, little Johnny, when he's three to by the time he's seven, saying more and more, you must be proud of yourself. You know, you're building self-efficacy, you're building their ability to manage in the world because they're not gonna have you there forever to do it and helping them to tolerate uncertainty, which is the biggest element from which anxiety emanates is important to get a hold of. Some of the bigger challenges are for our teens and young adults, right? Because they push back more and we have less control over them. So you have to work hard to help them managing physical distancing and safe contact, help them structure their days, which can easily devolve into Netflix and other things at rather than screen time. Uh, and how do you do that? All these other things, you know, get them to cook, cook with them, get them to exercise with you, uh, get them to engage in activities with you. If they're going to watch something, save it as a special thing to watch as a family or as a group together. Encourage them to practice their instrument and go on a jog and do all the things that they can do. And, and when you encourage them and they don't want to do it or they push back, you may have to adjust your own schedule to scaffold them even more, to align with them, to take that jog with them, to uh, work on their homework with them, whatever it is, so that you're able to spend time together and keep them bolstered up. And your job may suffer a little bit, and that may be something that has to happen once in a while when our kids need us at a crazy time like this. Uh, remote schooling is very difficult, and it's just, uh, it's just, um, you know, it's mind numbing for kids. Uh, a couple hours a day, sure, but six, seven, eight hours a day, like many of us, you in your job might be doing 10, 12 hours a day of screen time, and it's really mind numbing and our kids need help with that. So do what you can, try to build in breaks, try to help them manage that. Uh, empathize with their losses like graduation and dances and not seeing their friends, validate their disappointment. Don't try to put a sugar coating on everything because the reality is it does suck. And, and the most, one of the most important things going on in their life right now in teens and young adults is being with their friends. That's where they're at evolutionarily. That's part of what my book, Born to be Wild, is all about, how they need this time, how they need to be with each other, how they benefit from and, and learn and grow from those experiences. So to say, oh, it's okay, you'll be with them next week, next month, that, that may not be enough. So maybe it's okay to say, you know, that really sucks. It really sucks. And I, I wish I could fix it for you, but I can't. And that sucks. And again, back to healthy habits, sleep, exercise, nutrition, and some other things. And if you can, you know, it's maybe it's Pollyannish, maybe it's just positive thinking. But if you can focus on mindfulness, if you can do some meditation and deep breathing, if you can focus on being thankful for what you have, you know, this isn't the bubonic plague, which that's great because that killed, you know, a third of Europe or something. So this is terrible and manageable, and we will get through it. So I want to talk to you about resilience now. This is the second piece of, of what Andrew and I discussed would be useful to hear about. We didn't know too much about resilience 20 years ago. Most of the, the, mostly the field of psychology has focused on identifying what's wrong with you and trying to treat the sicknesses and the illness. But when we talk to parents and we say, what are schools for? You know, what do you want for your child by the time they graduate high school or college or middle school even. Parents don't say, I want my child to be great at Shakespeare or trigonometry. What they say is, I want my child to be a good citizen. 
I want him or her to have democratic principles, to share, to be responsible, to do what they say they're going to do, to know how to take care of themselves, know how to cook a meal, to know how to type a little bit, to know how to how to uh, support their friends. And, you know, Gallup is a big a polling agency in the U.S. I don't know if they work in New Zealand as well, but that's what their polls show, that over 90 percent of parents want their kids to learn things like acceptance of others and honesty and democratic principles and all the rest. So that's what we want to be teaching them. And I know that all schools teach some of this inadvertently by mistake, in a way. They're not consciously always trying to teach these things, but they do by virtue of doing your homework, uh, honoring the obligation you have to your friends to work on a school project together, going to your athletics, doing all the things that you commit to. But I think we can be a little more conscious about them too. And there are some things that we can definitely teach in school that we haven't always done that. Now I'm gonna take a slight diversion and talk to you just about mental health and physical health because this bears on resilience as well. We now believe that whether it's mental health or physical health, that about 20% of why we stay healthy and why we survive has to do with good doctors and hospitals, having access to healthcare, like the vaccine for COVID or uh, you know an ICU if you need it, and even having good insurance of which we don't have national insurance like you do, but we have some sort of weird versions of it. And, and having good health care makes a difference. And having good health literacy, knowing when to get screened and when to get support is important. About another 30% of our health outcomes is, is uh, due to genetics. And you can't choose your genes. So you do the best with what you have. You might be able to turn a few on and turn a few off, which might be more health promoting. But genetics have some portion of responsibility as well. But the other 50% is all socioeconomic. And that has to do with how much money we have, what kind of neighborhoods we live in, what kind of an education, which is very, very tied to poverty, very closely tied to poverty. Uh, and so what you know and what you learn and what you can do with that, your engagement with your community, the safety of your community, the water in your community, the food in your community, the access to outdoor spaces and places to exercise, uh, discrimination, racism, all of these things contribute to account for half of why we thrive or don't. And that's where we can have a big impact. We can't change our genes. We can work at a social level around, you know, good health literacy and doctors and hospitals and all that, but that's the minority factor. The big factors are how do we live? How do we spend our time? How do we engage with others? What do we eat? What do we drink? How much do we sleep? These things are the things that really determine our health. And if you look at mental illness in particular, this is just a grid showing you age along the, the horizontal or x-axis and a relative scale of, of how much something happens on the y-axis. And what you see is that the vast majority of mental illness sets on early. In studies in the United States, very good probability studies, we know that 50% of all mental illness sets on by the age of 14, 50% of all lifetime mental illness sets on by the age of 14, and 75% by the age of 24. Mental illness and substance use are early onset chronic disorders. They don't have to be chronic, but they're early onset, partly for genetic reasons and largely for uh, environmental reasons. Same with substance use. This curve, which I'm showing you from US data from 10 years ago, but it's the same curve no matter what piece of data you look at. Substance use starts in the mid late teen years. And if you haven't tried marijuana or cocaine or alcohol, even by the age of 26, there's almost no chance you'll try it. So these are important factors to consider as we think about resilience. So what is resilience? All right, so we're all gonna hit bumps in the road. There's no question that we're gonna hit bumps in the road. And so how do we overcome them? How do we deal with those bumps? We've been able to identify a series of domains or areas of resilience that matter. And I'm gonna first tell you what they are, and then I'm gonna tell you the ones that we can impact on an individual level. So one is temperament and that's neurobiology and that's not particularly changeable, how we're built, that's more genetic sociability matters. So to be pro-social, to be someone who engages others and is not shy is very important. Our attachment style is something our parents can have an impact on as well. Now you can function beautifully as a shy person in this world, but if you are pro-social, if you are gregarious, you actually tend to, on average, do better or have an advantage because you'll reach out for things, you'll connect to other people, and those things will make you stronger. Intelligence is not something that we can absolutely control, but there's so many different types of intelligence. And part of that is teaching people how to organize themselves, teaching people how to plan, make decisions, and do well in school. 
you know, uh, I'm not going to share it with you tonight, but I happen to know my IQ and it's not a genius IQ. I have been successful academically because I learned to work hard and organize myself. And, you know, you have to have a good enough IQ, but you don't have to be the top 1%. All you have to be is good enough and then work some and have the structuring around you to do that work. Communication skills like reading and language, learning how to express yourself in both written and verbal forms is very important for resilience. Personal attributes like self-efficacy, I was talking earlier about giving your kids that sense that they can do it themselves. We sometimes call that LOC or locus of control. The idea that you have a, an internal locus of control, you believe that you can impact the world and it will change in some ways because of what you do and not that you're always being changed by the world itself supportive families, higher socioeconomic strata, school support like good teachers and peers and a supportive community. These are all things that matter in resilience. Now, there are nine known individual resilience factors and I've highlighted a couple of them that are important for kids your age, kids in high school. And the first is emotion regulation. And this is a lot of what we're working on in adolescence and young adulthood, the ability to stay calm under pressure. Another is what we call causal analysis, this idea that you can identify a problem and a cause, and you don't, again, see the world as totally spurious or random. Another is impulse control, and we can teach people how to manage their impulses pretty effectively. Another very important one is self-efficacy. Again, this idea that you are powerful, you can change the world. Being optimist and a realist. So not seeing the world totally through rose-colored glasses or beer goggles, but rather thinking that things can change within the bounds of reality. Being able to read other people's social cues and feelings pretty well, reaching out, again, that gets to that pro-social factor, uh, reaching out for support and guidance, ingenuity, being creative, coming up with new ideas, and a sense of purpose is another one that is very important believing that there's a reason for this. And that can be faith for people, it can be religion, it can be culture, it can be family, it can be a rock, it can be anything you want it to be. But the idea of having some belief that this matters is important. Now I've distilled, I think, uh, these, these individual resilience factors into an acronym I call CHARM. And I use this in a series of interventions that I run in New York City, in schools and in colleges to try and help young people to be more resilient in the face of the difficulties that they are inevitably going to face. So I'm, I've been able to prove so far that we can improve self-efficacy, we can decrease dysfunctional or negative attitudes, and we can lower anxiety. And these are the kind of things that really matter. So the first is communication skills, and we have a number of ways to teach that. I don't know how you teach it at your school or in your home, but focusing on communication for boys, particularly being able to talk about feelings, why they argue, what's so important about arguing, and what lies under those feelings that make talking about the difficult things so difficult. And we have a number of ways to teach that, and that's valuable. What you can do at home is to talk with your kids and to wait and to pause and to invite them to talk, ask questions. And if they don't ask questions, if they don't answer your questions, ask more open-ended things. If that doesn't work, ask more specific things. Who'd you have lunch with today? Just to get them to start talking and to communicate with them and to help them with their communication, because that is a vital skill for life. And it also helps you get through some of these struggles. Healthy habits, I've talked about exercise, sleep, and nutrition already. There's a couple others that are helpful. Goal setting is very helpful. Actually labeling goals that you wanna work on. Those who write down their goals are more likely to achieve them. Also organizational skills I mentioned. And the idea that you can uh, learn how to manage a calendar, learn how to manage your school tasks. I don't know, you know if Westlake spends time on this, but for example, we actually can teach organizational skills and it makes a big difference. Look at your calendar every week, look at your calendar every day what's coming ahead, write down all your assignments, focus on your syllabus, these things are very helpful. So sleep, exercise, nutrition, goal setting, and organizational skills. Oh, there's all, um, anxiety and stress, and there's another one coming up that can be risk, and then there's gonna be mood, and, and I put them all up now together because anxiety and mood, we rely on many of the same techniques to deal with anxiety and mood. Mostly these come out of the psychology treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. And CBT is basically looking at our thought patterns, looking at our behavioral patterns, and understanding how they affect our emotions and how they make us feel. And we have many skills that we can teach 
to improve our emotions and our thinking patterns and our behaviors using CBT. And risk reduction is, is really what my, my book is about, Born to be Wild. And there are a number of things that parents can do there as well and schools can do. And I think you have another recorded talk from me last year on that that, um, that Andrew can share if it's, it's on YouTube, I think. But anyway, but we can teach these things in schools. We've been able to demonstrate that and you can teach it alongside academic material. You can focus on some of these things while you're doing literature and while you're doing mathematics, and you can also purposefully integrate some of this into curriculum. I'm a big advocate for a neuroscience curriculum. I think a neuroscience curriculum is science, and it also incorporates a lot of psychology and behavioral principles. And I think that schools can build these kind of curricula, and it's more palatable for colleges and teachers and parents and students because it's neuroscience, and it is neuroscience. All of these these uh, charm skills or resilience skills have science to back them up in ways that we can teach them. So uh, I'm mindful of the time and I don't want to take too much of your time, but I do want to just mention that when we look at mental illness and substance use, we have a number of things that, that work in prevention. And I've tried to, to align these up as those which have strong data, which we know work, those which have some data, and those which in the big picture are things that none of us at a school or at home are going to be able to impact directly, but we can at a societal level. So I'm going to go through them quickly. Some I've already mentioned. There's a certain style of parenting that is very effective, authoritative parenting. I'll talk more about that in a moment because that's something you can do at home. I'm sorry if you can hear some laughing. My wife is <laughs> working in the other room. We're both home. It's the evening here. And uh, I was in Virginia uh, visiting family and I've just come home. So I'm, I'm uh, in her workspace now, not in my office. Uh, enhanced supervision, uh, parents knowing what their kids are doing, managing screens, the triumvirate of good health, again, sleep, exercise, nutrition, delaying school start times for teens. We know that a later school start time is very health promoting for all sorts of reasons. We can get into another time, but we've got lots of data showing better grades, better energy level, less depression, less anxiety, fewer automobile accidents when kids have a later school start time in the adolescent range because their sleep cycles shift, as you're, you know. I've already talked about cognitive behavioral therapy, condoms, literally making condoms available is not only health promoting, but actually decreases mental illness and substance use. Because one of the comorbid or coexisting problems that kids have who get depressed or anxious or get into drugs and alcohol is a messy sexual life. And they may start to have sex early because they feel badly about themselves and depressed. They, and they might want to make other or help, other, um, help themselves feel better by having other people like them. And for some girls, unfortunately, that means having sex with boys before they're ready. This may lead to sexually transmitted infections and pregnancy. In the United States, 53% of Latina, which is Mexican, South American, and uh, Central American peoples in the United States of America, 53% of Latina teens get pregnant in teenage years. That's a minority population in the US. That is a population that is uh, more likely to be in poverty than the, than the majority population. And these sorts of things affect them greatly. And if condoms are available, kids do not have more sex, but they're more likely to, have to, to use a condom if they have sex. Targeted drug education, so not universal necessarily, although that's possibly valuable, but really looking at those kids who have a risk, a history, or a family history of using drugs. And then school-based mental health clinics, having counseling available at school makes a big difference for everybody, not just the kids who receive counseling. There's some data that community service uh, opportunities for kids, apprenticeships, bullying prevention, reducing the quantity of homework, mentorship and media literacy, teaching kids about how the media is manipulating them. There's some data that all of those things can be effective. And then in the big picture, poverty, uh, ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, that's trauma in childhood, elevating the drinking age, uh, having a graduated driver's license, so an apprenticeship driver's license teaching program, and after school programming. These are really effective. So I know you, you, you value sports a lot in your school and, and it, not every child wants to play sports or maybe they have to, I don't know, but if they don't have sports, it's music. If they don't have music, it's art. If they don't have art, it's extra tutoring. If they don't have that, it's, it's being a teacher's assistant for the younger kids or preparing class for the younger kids for the next day. But when we keep kids in school, teenage kids, they have many, many fewer risks and they're much less likely to fall into depression, anxiety, and substance use. So managing kids at home, uh, a few things and pieces of advice for you. I talked about authoritative parenting. So this is parenting that is directive, kind, loving, and firm with rules. So it's, I love you, and this is what we do. 
And we contrast authoritative parenting with authoritarian parenting, which is why, because I said so, permissive parenting, which is do whatever the hell you wanna do, and negligent, I'm not even paying attention. We know that kids who are raised by authoritative parents become adolescents who have better grades, less anxiety and depression, higher self-esteem, more social competence, they're more self-reliant, and lower rates of all the bad stuff we worry about. So this is the kind of parenting style that you wanna have at home. They also have attenuated or slowed growth of a part of the brain called the amygdala. This is a bilateral structure in the brain. It's a very old structure in terms of evolution. So many animals have it. And it is a structure that helps us identify threat and identify emotions. And when you have a big throbbing amygdala, you tend to misread emotions and you tend to, uh, I, I'm sorry, when you, yeah, when you have a, um, I'm sorry, attenuated growth, a shrunken amygdala, you tend to not read emotions well, and you tend to misinterpret intention, and you may become more aggressive. So we see, for example, small uh, amygdala commonly in kids with severe autism who misread social cues and don't look in the eyes and have a hard time perceiving threat. Kids who have a small amygdala are sometimes antisocial. They actually get more agitated. The amygdala helps us to maintain our cool and understand threat and less demanding, <clears throat> less demanding brain reward centers. So parent management training is how we teach authoritative parenting. You can actually teach this in school. This could also be, in my mind, part of, an of, a, of a neuroscience curriculum because we know that parents who learn these tools, and there's no reason high school students can't learn these tools because they're basic behavior modification tools, but those who learn these tools learn to use them well and can have an impact on the lives of others. These techniques include positive reinforcement, effective commands, selective or active ignoring, scheduling, like organizational stuff we were talking about before, rewards for good behavior, limit, limit setting with consequence, and for younger children, it's timeouts. But the first three or four concepts, reinforcement, commands, not requests to do things a certain way, actively ignoring things that you can safely ignore and scheduling and rewarding too. These are all positive things that we spend most of the time in parent training on. I sometimes make a, a part of my living. I mean, probably every week I have some families in parent training. I teach classes on this. I work with the courts. I work with families. I work with individual parents and we can teach this stuff. We actually teach this even in college at NYU. And we find that uh, people whose, whose parents use these tools become adolescents with all those good findings I was just describing. So finally, when to worry. Uh, what should concern you about your child if you're seeing some things you don't like and when do you bring them to a child psychiatrist or psychologist? And a caveat here is don't worry alone, that if you are concerned, we really encourage you to reach out. And I don't know who that would be in your community. Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your friends who have a child who went through some of this, maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's the school principal, maybe it's your minister, uh, priest, rabbi, maybe it's you know, a, 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 your pediatrician, a family doctor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, whoever you know, but, but don't worry alone because a lot of these things are normal that our kids go through. But what we're looking for is unexpected changes. Now, if you haven't raised kids before or you don't study children all day long like I do, then maybe you don't think about what's coming and what's typical. But even when you know what's typical, there is a range. And so you're looking for unexpected things that you don't expect to see. Unexpected changes in friendships, like their friendship group has totally changed. They're spending time elsewhere with other people. They're not bringing the same kids around. They're not bringing anybody around, but they're bringing around different kids. Uh, a change in anything related to their regular functioning. So they're not sleeping the same as they used to, too much or too little. Now, again, they hit adolescence, they're going to have a shifted sleep cycle. That's normal. But should they be sleeping till five at night and, you know, staying awake until four in the morning? No. So there are things to think about. Should they be oversleeping uh, and not able to get up and so exhausted all the time? Are they eating too much, too little? Is their attention and concentration changed dramatically? Has their energy level changed dramatically? Have there been changes in school and work? Those are their expectations. They go to school, that's their job. Some of them go to work as another job. Are there major changes in the performance of those activities? Are there changes in their emotions, mood, anxiety, the way they're dressing, the way they smell? All these kinds of things betray that there's something you're not expecting going on. Is there a change in their frustration tolerance, their ability to tolerate the difficulties and the ups and downs of life? And are they more irritable than usual? 
Is there a change in the activities and interests they typically enjoy? So these are the, the things and self-esteem that we worry about. These are the kind of things that we're looking for. And if these things change, of course you talk to your kids. Of course you ask them questions. Of course you try to figure it out. And maybe it's within the range of normal or they're stressed out by a project or they're stressed out because of quarantine or whatever. If these things persist, continue unchanged. If you're unable to get answers from your kids as to why this is happening, then I would encourage you to see somebody and get some support. So I think I made it within my 35 or 40 minute uh, request. And that is what I had to share with you. That's how you reach me. And uh, Andrew, thanks for inviting me. Jess, that's um, fantastic. Thank you so much um, again for giving up your time. Um, we really, um, yeah, we're really, really appreciative that you're a, you know, you're someone who we can rely on at Westlake and we're desperate to get you back. And when we can, we're going to work on a few ambitious plans, I think. But um, for now, we'll have sure. to make do with um, seeing you virtually. Get your copy you. of your book. If you haven't got it, you definitely need it. Get that right. Um, and we'll send all the links out as well. So, Jess, just to thank you from us. Um, you've given up your time. I know there'll be a lot of parents who will have watched that and, and just thought, wow, this is something we can really get into. And it's so accessible as well, which I think is is part of what makes you such an engaging presenter. So thank you. And um, the most important thing from us is we know you're such a good guy who cares so much. And um, I think that carries that carries through in all of your presentations. So we can't thank you thank enough. You. Um, we hope you're on NZ Shores sometime soon. And definitely when you are, um, there's a home for you at Westlake. So thank you so Love much. Have a, have a great rest of the day. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.